everyone. I'm Amanda Olson from Intimate Rose, and I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. And I am joined today by Kate, who is a sex educator, and we are going to talk about all things pelvic floor as it relates to sex. So Kate, can you talk to me about your practice and about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to, to be here and be chatting. And so I am a certified sex educator and the founder of Passion by Kate. We're an educational platform for pleasure and sexual freedom. And so through the platform and then through the one-on-one -on -one work that I do, really at the core, it's helping to people to uncover and ask for and integrate more pleasure in their lives, more of what they want, because we're never really given the tools to do that or taught how to do that. And so it's let's reconnect to pleasure, let's reconnect to what we want in the bedroom and out and find really practical and powerful ways to incorporate those into our everyday life. So Kate, one of the things that you do in your practice is you work on using pleasure for healing and helping people to opt optimize their sexual relationships and sexual health. So can you talk to me about what that looks like? Yeah, so pleasure is one of those, I find it I find all of our conversations about pleasure really fascinating because as a society, on one hand, we really demonize it and we're like, pleasure is bad and it's wasteful and it's, it's not productive, blah, 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 blah. And on the other hand, like the other hand, in the next breath, we acknowledge its power. So to use food as an example, right? A few years ago, there was like all those stories about Oreos being as addictive as cocaine and all, right? <laughs> so we talk about, on one hand, like it's wasteful and why should we pay any attention to it? And on the other hand, we're like, this shit is powerful. Like this stuff is really, really powerful. And so I approach pleasure again in the bedroom and out as this healing force, as something that really is behind a lot of our decisions, including sex, including food, including work, including our relationships. And as something that's not just like the cherry on the cherry on top, but actually vital. So we know it's powerful. We know that we can, if we accept it and embrace it and say like, this is, can be a powerful force, we can use it to begin to unearth and heal shame, to begin to accept the things that bring us pleasure, to be able to speak up about it and to lean into it more. And one of the things that I always stress and the reason that I talk about in the bedroom and out is because sex is such a vulnerable experience. It's such a highly charged time. It's taboo. Again, we don't get good education around it. And so if we begin to practice incorporating pleasure into other parts of our lives, it becomes easier to experience it in all parts of our lives. And slowly but surely the healing happens. Yeah. So you start with the out of bedroom life sometimes. Yeah. Life I mean, adjustment it, and it, it's, yeah. yeah. It's so person to person, but I would say most of the time we're starting with little things like I need you to walk away from your lunch or from your desk at lunch for just 10 minutes go outside if it's nice, go sit by a window if it's shitty and just like let that, just do that. Or when you get home from work, when if you're, you know, a stay at home parent, when you're, and you have a spouse, when they get home from work, when you're transitioning, take 10 minutes and have some sort of transition ritual to get you out of that like working mode, whatever that work is for you person to person and into more of that, like just relaxing and being mode. And there's just so many different ways that you can incorporate this. It's so challenging in what I feel is like the just common American life, like regardless of what their occupation is or whether they're stay at home, that those transitions are not happening or they're very abrupt and life has just become really stressful and task oriented. And we're like, we can do it all. Mm -hmm. Check, 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 check. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we never stop and pause and just kind of be in the moment or, or we also don't prioritize the fun stuff as much. Right. Right. It's so true. It's so true. Um, and so along those lines, um, if you are treating, let's, let's start with um, women or people that identify as women who have a history of trauma mm -hmm. and they're looking to say, maybe they're seeing a pelvic physical therapist such as myself, and they're looking to reincorporate that pleasure. Yeah. Um, do you have common threads or common things that you educate them on or things that you mm -hmm. say or cues that you like? Yeah. So I always, always in those cases, will start again, kind of outside the bedroom. How can we start reconnecting? How can they start reconnecting to their pleasure in ways that feel safe to their system, to their nervous system? Because, so we always talk about, right? The popular meme is like, you have to go outside your comfort zone, which is true. 
But the other part of that that doesn't get talked about is that there's the comfort zone, there's the uncomfortable discomfort zone, whatever you want to call it. And then beyond that, there's actually the snapback zone. And we know this, this comes from pedagogy, this comes from trauma teachings, right? And so that's where it's like too far out and our systems get like triggered, fully triggered, not just like activated, but triggered back to like deep protection. And so it's finding that balance and saying like, what is something that will feel pleasurable, but not overload your system. And that's so, right, that's a personal conversation. So it's always starting in that place. And what I usually say is like, it makes you feel a little nervous, but it doesn't make you wanna like run and hide and curl up in a ball or lash out or whatever it is that individuals, right? We all have different ways of coping with that. So it's definitely starting there. And I really, in my practice, a big part of, of it is really, helping people reconnect with their own agency. So I, I mm. value research, I value science, and I also think that there is a lot that we just don't know. I mean, we, we know right. there's a lot we don't know. And so I also really highly value people's own truth and, and what they've lived because they're in their bodies and their lives 24 seven. So for me, it's about like, okay, here's what the research tells me. We have to find that place that's uncomfortable, but not unsafe. And so what does that look like for you person that I'm working with? And what does that look like for you person that I'm working with? And we custom create that. We kind of, we alchemize it together, the expertise and the lived experience. Absolutely. I 100% agree that, and especially too, sometimes the evidence doesn't match the person sitting in front of us and it's in my field and it's in your field. Yeah. And so we, and they are living in their skin and they know that like, that is not a good match for me. Exactly. And I even think of my personal journey with pelvic floor physical therapy, which I've written about extensively. And like all of my physical therapy, we just had to keep regressing and keep regressing. And if you looked at the charts, it made no sense because I was a 29 years old and like help, you know, but we just had to keep regressing, regressing, regressing the activities. And, you know, I'm grateful because I've had, I've worked with a lot of physical therapists in my life and I'm grateful to have found someone who managed both my pelvic floor and my regular who is willing to do that and kind of throw the book away, if you will, to what you're doing yes. and just say like, okay, this is what your body is actually responding to you. And I think it just gets back to trusting ourselves and trusting what's in front of us and grounding into our truth and our intuition. Absolutely. And certainly as practitioners, checking ourselves and, you know, recognizing that, you know, our main treatment protocol is just it's not, it's not going to be a cookie cutter in, in this realm, in most realms, but especially in this realm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I love that. That's wonderful. Um, and then how about reintegrating? So we've talked about like outside of the bedroom and then inside of the bedroom. Do you have a common um, theme as to how people integrate the actual like penetrative sex? Like I think for a lot of women, a lot of my patients will say um, is that, you know, we work on um, mind body control. We work on breathing. Mm -hmm. We work on learning how to relax the pelvic floor and how to like resume control there. Um, and we work on maybe dilator use or, um, mm -hmm. you know, general um, other things, but um, the carryover to the bedroom, that's when I always call in amazing sex educators like yourself to help with the carryover because sometimes, yeah. you know, I'm in a medical field and I'm a therapist by any other word, but you know, and I, and I really foster and form what I feel to be a good therapeutic alliance, but because I'm in the medical realm, I worry sometimes about the crossover into yeah. that passion and into the relationship aspect that I have not the proper training to be yeah. helping with at this point in my career. Yeah. <laughs> Some pelvic physical therapists do go on yes. to be asex certified and to, to be, um, you mm -hmm. know, certified in counseling and those kinds of things. Yep. I am not. So tell yeah. me what you do. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and it gets so important to kind of name that too. And I so appreciate you naming that because again, we always see like, oh, I'll go to my gynecologist for sex information. And I'm like, cool. I train gynecologists sometimes. So yeah. they, they, because medical schools aren't right, aren't doing it. And no. most programs, <laughs> physical therapy programs aren't doing it. Like standard schooling programs aren't focusing on sex or they have one little thingy or like we have to three hour lecture. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So anyways, to answer your question, I'll, I'll get off my um, little stool here. <laughs> We're so fucked. To answer your question. So one of the things I, the very first thing I do is check in with them about what they even want. And this goes back to that agency conversation because we are told from a very young age in all of these insidious and overt ways that sex looks like a penis going into a vagina. And that is the only real sex. That is sex. 
right? And so for so many of us until, for myself and as well, and for all of my clients, until something happens where that isn't working for them anymore for whatever reason, they, and even until they kind of have gotten to me, have ever stopped and said like, do I even enjoy this? Mm-hmm. Is this even something I want as part of my sex life? So that's where I start is like, do you even want it? And if the answer is no, then I'm like, cool, great. Let's talk about how we can get you what you want. And right. if the answer is yes, then we can start looking at, okay, cool. How do we get to the, what do you need again to feel safe? And when I'm talking about safe, I'm not talking about unhealthy relationships. I'm not talking about, I'm saying, what does your physical body and your nervous system need to feel safe for penetration? Because yeah. if you're going to pelvic floor PT, if you have medical issues, if you have had shitty sex in the past, all of that stuff comes into the bedroom with you. You know, totally. sex isn't this separate thing that like is totally not a part of our lives and doesn't impact any, or it's not impacted by anything else. So what do you need? What was the best sexual experience you had? Then we'll start reflecting on like, what has made sex great in the past? What are some common themes to look sure. at and start to pull those out? And how do we start to integrate those? And sure. often, because I am often working with couples, you know, it's things that they, it's the way their partner initiates. It's how their partner reacts when they say, I don't know what I'm in the mood for right now. It's them being able to say like, I'm not super turned on, but let's start making out and see where it goes. But like no promises. And so it's learning all, honestly, a lot of those interpersonal pieces as well. Yeah. How to communicate in a way where the partner's not taking it. I mean, we can't, can't control how another person responds to us, but we can learn words that work. (laughs) Yes. And we can learn, like I always say, like your part, you know, partners are allowed to have feelings, obviously. (laughs) Right. But it's, how do you kind of be, how do we all begin as humans to say like, okay, I'm feeling this way. And that doesn't give me permission to like shame or blame another person. And particularly if we look at gender roles and like a lot of times, right. Particularly in like a heterosexual relationship, like the man will take that rejection. It's like an attack on their masculinity and their manhood. And they often aren't even aware of it and it's not their fault. And so I always tell them, and I say this to my partner all the time, you know, it's not your fault that you've been socialized this way, but it is your responsibility to begin to start unpacking that. And it's for the good of our relationship and for our pleasure and for our intimacy and for your sex life. So it's working together. And I'm really lucky to have really fucking awesome clients where, you know, there might be some resistance at first, but they're really committed to each other. They're really committed to like, let's find ways that we both can have the pleasure we want. And it's not always easy. None of it is. Life's not always easy. But yeah. And it means they have the tools going forward. So they kind of, not that they'll never need support again but they have something that they have a good foundation to fall back on. Yeah. And I Instead love of just how like, you... here's a bunch of positions to try, which we also right. do talk about. Let's be real. Like we also are like, cool, let's, let's get into the nitty gritty of like what positions are going to make things work better for you. If you're yeah. coming back to penetration, what toys, what tools, but that's like this much of the work that I do, to be honest. Sure. I believe it 100% because I mean, when we're talking about a mind body response and a physiological response, so much, so much of it is driven by the brain, whether it's like cognitively in the awareness level or deep, okay. deep, deep, deep in the, in the subconscious level. Yeah. And I love what you said about how it's not the, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Mm-hmm. Like if we are going to make this work together, yeah. then it is your responsibility mm-hmm. to understand your own reactions yep. to what I'm going through. Cause yeah. you know, it's not as the, as the person suffering, it's not their fault either. <laughs> they don't exactly. not choose to be <sighs> having these issues. Nobody oh. does <laughs> vulnerable shaming experiences mm-hmm. I think uh, that are out there because yeah. of how society frames it and mm-hmm. all of those things that you said yeah yeah that's yeah. that's really important really cool um so one of the fun things is that I um you know I get questions all the time yes. I mean as part of 
these, these relationships I have, you know, people ask me things and sometimes mm-hmm. I know the answer and sometimes I don't. Um, I am a member of Ishwish. So in terms of like the sexual health, like I, I feel like I have some really good resources and I have access to research and all that good things. <laughs> but some of the basic, like common things, I just don't understand like the physiological response. And one of the things that I had asked you about was the role of anal stimulation yes. in pleasure. So please educate us. I read your blog article. It was so beautifully done. I love, I love how you talk. I love how you write. Um, because it's one of those things where even the most conservative, you know, how a person appears is not necessarily indicative of how they want to behave sexually. And just because something seems crazy doesn't make it so. So I guess the way I'm trying to frame that is, is like this is this could be a part of a normal, like healthy functioning self sexual relationship without it necessarily being perceived as not such. So can you talk to me about that? Yeah, absolutely. So right, I love that you said that because we can't look at someone and know what their sex life is like. And we can't know what their desires are. We can't know what they're into and what they're not into. And we're all so, so different. And so when it comes to butt stuff, as I'll just lovingly clump it all right, I think there are a few points to make. Number one is that we tend to talk or butt stuff tends to get talked about as intercourse, just like we talk about, right, with real sex is PIV. We tend to think about anal intercourse. And the way that I look at butt stuff is it's anything that has to do with like the butt cheeks, the anal opening, penetration, et cetera. And the way that I normalize it for people all the time is I'm like, have you ever gotten a good massage where they've worked on the like hips and glutes and like really like that is a pleasurable experience. Even that's not the purpose right necessarily of a massage, it's relief and right. so on and so forth. But like, yeah. you just often there's so much there and it's just like, oh, this is such good relief. And so there are a few things. Number one, a lot of us sit all day. So any sort of tension and what not it builds up in our hips, builds up in our low back. I'll yeah. tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> it builds up definitely. in our pelvic floor. So there can be a lot of really sweet release, if you will, from kind of playing in that area, touching, massaging, bringing pleasure to that area, just because it's, it's so overworked these days by being underworked in a weird way, right? Yes. Um, yeah. The other piece, the second piece is that we always talk about like the pleasure nerves and the nerves to the penis and the nerves to the clitoris that same nerve actually branches off and goes to the anal opening. And so there is, you know, there's not as many nerve endings. There's not the 8,000 that are in the clitoris or throughout the penis, right? But there are a lot of nerve endings and there are a lot of pleasure nerve endings that can feel really good from all sorts of stimulation. The third thing is that most of those nerve endings are actually just in the first third. So for people who are like, well, I'm curious, but I don't know how I feel about this full penetration thing, but like, ugh you don't actually have to ever go all the way at all. It just doesn't have to happen because most of those nerve endings can be stimulated from just playing around the anal opening, from going in just a little bit without having to do full penetration. So there are so many reasons why people like that stuff. There are so many reasons why it feels good. And of course, for every person who loves it, there's someone for who's like, oh, that's not it. And The other thing with butt stuff is there are more safety concerns to keep in mind, given that the anus doesn't lubricate itself. So you need to make sure you're providing that. Given that the the tissue is not quite as flexible as the vaginal tissue, so you need to work up to it a bit more. And also that pain is considered normal for anal sex, and it's just not, it really shouldn't be. Like anal, any sort of anal play and penetration shouldn't hurt. And in that case, the pain really is a sign that something is, you need to slow down, you need to start smaller, you need to add more lubricant, you may need to stop altogether. And so, you know, recognizing that pain is not, I mean, pain, pain during sex is something that should be addressed as well. But I think there's just this, what I've heard and what I've seen over the last decade is like, oh, well, it's just supposed to hurt. There's just this acceptance of it. I'm like, no, actually, you might just need to start with a finger instead of a cock. Right. Yeah. It's just like a hamstring, you know, it's like we would, we would, it would be damaging. And even thinking about it hurts to think about like, just push yourself into the split. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just do it. Go. <laughs> wow, that does think, hurt to think about. <laughs> yeah. 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 Interesting. That's awesome. That's my Thank you. Stuff primer. And like you said, there are, thank you for your compliments. Um, there are, it's one of the things I get asked about the most. So I write sure. about it a lot because people are always like, that stuff. 
Yeah. That's, and it's also one of the most divisive topics that comes up. You have the people who love it, the people who hate it. Um, so it therefore gets a lot of attention. <laughs> Absolutely. And I get, you know, patients that are being asked by their partner and they're, you know, so they're like wanting to please them and they're mm-hmm. like unsure. I mean, if they're in pelvic therapy, we're addressing pelvic floor dysfunction. So they're uncertain about like safe and healthy ways right. to, to integrate it. And, um, so that, that information is so awesome. And I think, especially for my colleagues that are going to be watching this, mm-hmm. that is going to be super, um, informative. So yeah, that's right. great. And we can, you can like link in the video, right? So people can can find those. Great. Yeah, to the article. Absolutely. Or not in the video, okay. in the caption. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. What else, what else do you want people to know about your practice or what you do? Oh, you know, big question here. <laughs> Ooh, what else do I want people to know? I think just that pleasure is really something that's a, I view as a birthright. And I think that is something that makes my work a little bit different. And that is the approach that I'm taking in all of my work is that this is something you deserve no matter who you are, period. And it's not something to be ashamed of and that you deserve to create it to create really is what I think about. I don't think about it. I don't think about people as having sex lives. Right? I think about it as you're creating a sex life that is intimate and passionate and exciting and fulfilling and pleasurable and what that looks like is really up to you and so that's that's underneath all of the work i do i think that's probably the most important thing to know because that's some people's jam and it's other people's not which i totally get i think that's really rewriting the narrative i really like that i love it That's great. Well, is there anything that you would like to know about pelvic physical therapy on the other end? You've been, you've been to pelvic yes. physical therapy, so you are already like really well versed. But... Fan girl, big fan girl. <laughs> therapy. Yeah. So one of the things that actually comes up a lot for me because, so I knew about pelvic floor long before I started going because when you're in this field, like we all yeah. kind of intersect and overlap. Yeah, and like you said, there are several, you know, physical therapists who are also sex educators. And so one of the, one of my big questions is people are always like, that's a thing. Oh my God. What is that? Like, wait, it's internal. Oh, right. And it's just like this stream of reactions is the same every time. And yeah. so one of my big questions is like, how do we build more awareness around this? How do we make pelvic floor a thing? Basically right? right. Um, pelvic floor PT a thing because it's so helpful and it's so healing and I know I was seen for low back pain. I wasn't even seen for sexual dysfunction. And I'm very lucky I had an insurance company that allowed that, right? But how do we begin building awareness for something that is so powerful and such an amazing tool, and yet doctors aren't offering it? I had to ask for a year and basically convince them. I felt like I was asking for drugs. Like, I really did. That was the right. Kind of- how do we work on this consumer wise, like consumer client patients, yeah. but also amongst healthcare providers and professionals? Yeah, it's on, it's on all of us. It's on us <laughs> in particularly. Um, pelvic health physical therapy has been a recognized form of physical therapy for over 40 years, which, you know, people, people have no idea. My, my section of the American Physical Therapy Association had its 40 year anniversary last year. And here we are. And, you know, people are just now learning about it. So, um, you know, we have a new wave of pelvic PTs who are using social media and using Mm. personal connections to build trusting foundations, um, not just in their communities, but online. I think online has been probably the biggest boom. When I started as a pelvic health therapist, 11 years ago, there's a couple hundred of us in the nation. And now there are tens of thousands of us. I mean, we are everywhere, but it's also, it's up to us to have those relationships with our doctors. I'm lucky to live in a place where, you know, gastroenterology, urology, um, pain docs, like I've got those relationships with all of them, but those take time. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've got to be doing that as public PTs is like treating the patients and taking care of people and, and building that trust. And then using our platforms, using YouTube using Instagram where, where the people are to like show them what we do. I get a lot of people now into my company into intimate rows that are being referred by girlfriends and sisters. 
Um, and I think that the boom, I'm seeing a lot of my colleagues posting awesome content online and I think resharing that. And then in, in our personal relationships, we have a duty to be referring to you as sex educators. We have a duty to be, I mean, we're as physical therapists, we get used to quarterbacking to pain specialists and neurology and gynecology and like, re, you know, sometimes <laughs> redirecting like, mm -hmm. You have some signs of celiac. I think we need to get gastroenterology <laughs> on board. We these yeah. things come up, and it's we catch a lot of these things. So um, all of that's a way of saying I think I think the answer is solid, trustworthy content being shared. You know, in France, it's automatic. Every woman that know, delivers a baby gets eight I to know. twelve visits of pelvic physical therapy. Everyone knows what it is in France. <laughs> I know. And I actually am part of a um, networking group that's a lot of like French expats living in New York and they're all moms. And it's, I love talking with them because they're just like, this is stupid. Basically, they're like, yes! it's so stupid how in, and I shouldn't use stupid because it's an ableist term. It's ridiculous how in the States, like this is like, what do you mean? Like, of course I had it. Like, it wasn't even a question. It just happened. You go I to didn't the ask. It was given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You go to the doctor, you have a baby, this happens. Period. Yeah. yeah. And I love what work. you said too, because it is so connected to all the things and like, it is literally the core of our body, but we just yeah. ignore it because God forbid it's like sexual, like, right. uh, like adjacent, right. <laughs> it's like a sex adjacent. And so therefore it's, I, I'm going to say it's tainted, which is also a really good pun. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. What and it's not think? billable by insurance. I mean, we get people in for pain with sex, which is for all of us as, as pelvic PTs, as sex educators, like that is a vital part of their life. And we are 100% ready to, mm. to, to treat it and to work with them. But we bill it as pelvic pain. We don't bill it as pain with sex because re the insurance does not yeah. feel that that is an adequate thing to reimburse mm -hmm. for. So yeah. we, we have to get creative in how we take care of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's bananas. So it anyways. Really is. There's another question that popped up as you were talking, but of course it disappeared from my brain now. Um, the, taint, the taint joke took over. Um, <laughs> and so now it's gone, but it'll hopefully come back. Yeah, so for speaking of insurance, because this is also the, the question I get asked a lot, and I should mention that like New York City is just a special unicorn when it comes to all healthcare, regardless. Sure. So I don't think New York them. is the best example, but the, one of the most common questions I get is, you know, is it, how do we work with insurance companies? Because my work, for example, is just completely non, basically non-existent. There's, it is impossible for me to bill. It just doesn't right. exist, right? Yeah. We, our work doesn't exist. But public floor, like you just mentioned, it can be. So I'm curious about kind of access as well, because yeah. there's awareness and then also access. Oh, and then the question I had was, where can people go to look? Because NYU has a public floor center you can't find it on the website. Right. So like if I'm looking, when you're looking, most insurance websites, you just are like physical therapy and they give you all of the people. So yeah. how can that kind of the access piece, both from the insurance perspective, but also from like, how do people find besides word of mouth? Like when people ask me and they don't live in New York and I can't yeah. send them to the, my contacts here, what do I tell them? There's a couple of different, very trustworthy databases. Cool. Um, first and foremost, um, American Physical Therapy Association Academy of Pelvic Health PT Locator. You go in. <laughs> you will put Long in your name. Code. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, the people can, and we can link these too. But people can put in their zip code, and it will pull up all the therapists and their credentials. Because not all of us are trained equally. You know, all of us, all of us have different experience levels, and some of us treat different things. So you can see the credentialing of the PT um, and you can see where they're located and what they treat. Um, likewise, Herman and Wallace Pelvic Institute also has a PT locator where you can enter by zip code and find the PTs. Those are two very reputable places. Other really great ones, um, Pelvic Guru has a mm. search component to her website. My pelvic floor muscles does, and I do as well at Intimate Rose. So um, when when we we have a pelvic health network, so that people can be referred back out to pelvic PTs in their area. And I mean, it, it's me. It when when those questions come, it's me. So whether they're in our network or I <laughs> tap into my own, you know, I'm an APTA section member. I yeah. am Herman and Wallace credentialed. So we will find you a person, <laughs> and I may or may not know them very very well. <laughs> 
Um, but that's how you find them. And then with insurance, it varies state by state and it varies by insurance. Mm -hmm. In general, I have yet to see an insurance company that doesn't cover some form of pelvic floor physical therapy. And it's usually on the pelvic floor physical therapist to like understand what the, what the person is needing in front of them. And um, billing it appropriately so that it is mm. covered and reimbursed. Like I said, we've known for a long time that dyspareunia, this general blanket term for painless sex, is not covered. So it, the person is having pain, okay? So we call it pelvic pain in female mm -hmm. or pelvic pain in male. They are still binary. Mm -hmm. I think that there's our new like pelvic pain, like non-binary sort of things, but there's some place to put them. Um, and then state by state, it can be direct access. So like, for example, Oregon, we have 30 days direct access. Someone can come and see me without a prescription. Um, and most insurances, that's fine. Some insurances are going to require that prescription. Mm. There's a min there's so many different ways to get them. I get them from ER docs. I get them from primary care docs, gynecologists, mm -hmm. gastroenterology, like anybody who can write a prescription <laughs> <laughs> that is willing to be on the follow up. Cause we are, we're going to send back an eval. We're going to send back a 30 day progress yeah. note. We're going to send back a reeval. So that person that whoever writes it can't just like jump ship. Like they got to yeah. have a vested interest in the person. Um, but I get them from all over and so the prescription comes, mm. insurance is billed, and it just depends on the insurance plan, like yeah. whatever, you know, sometimes it's co-pay, sometimes it's co-insurance, mm -hmm. both, yeah. um, but there are ways to find it to get covered. Um, some pelvic PTs have moved to a cash-based practice, yeah. um, and so they just work with them, and, you know, there's high motivation on the part of the PT and the, the um, patient to work together to get them better, really, in a timely manner when they're paying cash, so... Mm -hmm that works great sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting because I actually was under the assumption that most insurance plans didn't cover it. So oh, really? Is, yeah. Because of oh. just horror stories that I've heard from people. So sure. that is really interesting and filed away and a really important piece of information for me to have. Yes. It's all about <laughs> using an appropriate code mm -hmm. that describes yep. what you're doing that serves the person mm -hmm. holds the insurance right there. Yeah. Yep. I'm reminded of like heel, like heel pain and podiatry is another one where you have to like code it properly, not speaking from any personal experience here <laughs> so that you can get like your inserts because they'll cover it if it's this reason, but not if it's that reason. And so, yeah. And you're hurting. It's, you're exactly. It's, yeah, exactly. So that's yeah. how informative this is. Okay. The only, like the other big question along with like, oh my God, that's a thing. Okay. How do I find it? Yeah. That I hear all the time is like, and I'm sure, I'm sure this comes up all the time in your circles is basically we've come to equate pelvic health and pelvic wellness with kegels. Ah, uh, yes. Yay, clickbait. And I know from personal experience and from my connections with pelvic floor PT is that kegels aren't actually right for everyone. Right. And in fact, they can cause more harm than help for someone for whom they're. So how do people, particularly maybe someone who's like just learning all of this and is like, what do I need to figure out? Do I need to see someone or not? Like what? Yeah. What, did, what advice? How can we help people kind of figure out for themselves to a degree, right? Like yeah. if, if kegels are going to be helpful, if that's going to be something that's going to be supportive of them or not, because if they Google basically anything related to the pelvic floor, the first thing that comes up is kegels. Yeah. So that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of people have that agency and empowerment and education. Sure. Um, I mean, the blanket statement wise, it's really hard to know what is right for someone without doing a full assessment. And so, I mean, the, like the, the A level answer is going to be to go see a pelvic physical therapist, even if it's just for consult, even if you're not going to have this, you know, long ongoing treatment just to see, do I have muscles that are too tight? Do I have muscles that are too loose? Do I have muscles that are just uncoordinated and they don't know what to do? Um, Kegels are a contraction of the pelvic floor muscle. So if this is your pelvic floor, a Kegel named after Dr. Kegel in the 1950s is a contraction of the pelvic floor. So doing this, if the muscles are already too tight and they do this over and over again, it is going to perpetuate that mm -hmm. pain cycle. It is going to create possibly further issues. Um, whereas if the muscles are too weak, Kegels are absolutely one of the things that can help <laughs> with it. it. There's a lot going on. There's a diaphragm, there's hips, there's things, but Kegels can be a part of that treatment protocol. The kicker is people want to think, okay, urinary leakage, that's an underactive, too loose problem. Mm -hmm. 
the problem is, is not always. The problem is, is that usually, yeah, but sometimes the, belt, the muscles are too tight yep. and you're getting, um, okay. you're getting inflexibility, you're getting um, immobility of the muscles. And so one would think I'm, I'm leaking, I'm going to contract, but it's actually working against yep. you. So for this reason, generally best, I mean, a, a, a blanket statement would be if you have any pain at all, if you're having defecation issues like constipation, if you're having pain with sex, if you have hip pain and low back pain, which is often a product or driven by pelvic floor dysfunction, ask your doctor for a consult eval with pelvic floor physical therapy. We call them evaluations because that's yep. what we do. We take into consideration you as a person, we ask you a lot of questions, and then we, we look and see what is the behavior of these muscles. Yeah. Great. And what about if doctors say no? Because I had, like I said, I had that. I had my doctors, I had several doctors say, I don't mm -hmm. think you need that. And then we were talking back surgery at 29. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. So like, this what do you why... do? And I mean, I'm an, I'm a patient. I, my background is in healthcare. I've worked in hospital systems. Yeah. So like, I feel good being like, this is not okay. Right. But for the average patient, they ask a doctor, it's already a vulnerable ask. The doctor is like, oh, you don't need that. Yeah. Or it doesn't work. They're not a direct access state or in, yeah. in New York, a lot of the hospital, even though New York is direct access, some of the hospitals aren't. So like, so oh. some of the places like NYU is not a direct access for physical therapy. You can't just go in, even though New York state is. So, you know, that's yes. not an option or someone doesn't know. So how do we respond to doctors? And also like, how do you, what advice do you, can you give to someone who's like, nervous about this because this is vulnerable work there's no way yeah. around it i tell people it's internal and they're like <gasps> and i'm like okay yeah i guess <coughs> excuse me so yeah those yeah. are two questions but i, feel like I love because i'm like it's, it is like 100 percent comes up every day um okay so what do we do okay so we ask a doctor for something in, as innocuous and conservative as physical therapy and they say no we get a second and we get a third opinion it is not okay and i i i'm usually a really like gentle uh politically accurate person it is no longer okay for us to not be listened to right mm -hmm. it is no longer not okay it is no longer okay to be recommending something as severe as back surgery to a young woman without having tried, in the absence of a tumor, in the absence of a broken bone or something glaring, like mm -hmm. we, it, it's just not okay anymore. And I've had medical errors made on me and I watch it happen on my patients and I'm no longer okay with it. We get a second opinion, we get a third, third opinion. We don't stop until someone listens. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not okay. It's not, it's not. And then um, people are totally scared. And that's our role as a physical therapist to, you know, let them know, you know what, I'm not on a mission. So, you know, the internal work may happen on the first day. It may happen on the eighth day. It may never happen. We've got other ways. We, I say that um, there's more than one way to wrap a present, right? And I've got them all. We've got imaging techniques. We've got biofeedback techniques. There's a lot we can do if you're not feeling ready. Most of my patients, because of this stage I'm at in my career, they come in and they're like, I, I am ready. I took a shower. <laughs> I heard about what you do. I want, I want to figure out what's going with Just me. Go in. <laughs> I want this to happen. And they're like mentally ready mm -hmm. because their physician has prepped them as to like, Amanda is mm -hmm. really good. She's going to take care of you. And yeah. she's kind and she's sweet. And I think that that's part of the trust that we build in our communities and with our referral. Because if the referral source is like, good luck. <laughs> You know, here's your prescription. She's going to do a vagina massage. Like, that's not what I do. And of course, someone's going to be frightened. Um, so I think it's in how we prep and like, you know, how, just how, how we form those relationships. But it still doesn't change that fluttering. I don't love going and getting a pap. I just, you know, it's nobody's favorite part of their day. If it was, I'd probably have to kick them out. <laughs> But I have to say that like when we use, you know, when we use our resources and we gain that, what I call a therapeutic alliance, just when we yeah. are like really meshing and like meeting the needs of our patients, finding what ticks for them, that it, it just gets so much easier. I use like, like clean 1950s humor. I, I just think that like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So I, I like to put people at ease and let them know like, you know, usually I do an internal exam, but it doesn't have to happen today. If you're not feeling ready. Yeah. We'll do it another time. Yeah. 
So that's kind of how I go about things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's so important. Cool. Yeah, and then I know we talked a little bit about trauma and pleasure with my work, but I'm curious how it shows up in your work and how it gets addressed in your work. Yeah, so I know the conversations right. I've had, but again, not the average patient. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, cool, tell me everything you're doing. That's like, oh, I have this. So, but I'm curious, like how it shows up in your office. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, I think the report rate of a history of sexual abuse or sexual trauma is at 25% nationally. That's the report rate. I think that where we are in 2020, that's going to come up because women are feeling ready and more comfortable to talk about it. But all that's to say is that in my clinic, it's 75% of my population because people that experience trauma, the, the, that trauma has them doing different types of muscle clenching, different types mm -hmm. of behaviors, moving differently. Um, not to mention that most of the time, those traumas are not gentle. Um, so it can, it, that can be the damaging factor. It, it could be also that they weren't injured during that, that experience, but, um, as a protective ex uh, response, they're, they're contracting, they're clenching, they're, they're moving differently because their body, your brain has one job, right? One job. And that's to keep us alive. And so if they feel like I'm going to protect you and this is the way I keep you alive by making sure that never, ever happens to you. And it's not, you know, whether or not our, our cognitive brain knows it's true, that our little deep inner brain root that is trying to help us, mm -hmm. um, it's going to do whatever it thinks is going to be helpful for us. So um, for most of my patients that have trauma, I'm seeing overactive pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So the muscles are too tight. They are clenched. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes they have tender points in there or they're uncoordinated, you know, we tend to dissociate after trauma. Our, our brain um, protects us by not paying attention um, or losing coordination and control of, of our body. Interestingly, um, sometimes we walk different, but yeah. we definitely control our organs and our pelvic floor differently. And so um, sometimes I'm seeing them for constipation, you know, they're in and they're having constipation issues. And I, I, it's on my intake form and I ask every single one, do you have a history of sexual trauma or abuse? And mm -hmm. it's, it's so high. It's such yeah. a high preference rate. So yeah. I let them know that as we're going through this process, you know, cause some of them will say, oh yeah, but it was 20 years ago and I'm fine. I had counseling. I'm okay. Yeah. And I just let them know during this process, things may come up in, even though mm -hmm. like, you know, that I'm not here to hurt you, your inner brain may have trouble mm -hmm. with me. So you just let me know if we need to stop, if we need to just continue. And sometimes I'll recommend that they go back to counseling or go back mm -hmm. to therapy or have that therapist on board while we're going through the process. So, um, I live in a bit more, I, I live in a medium sized town that's very surrounded by rural. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I have a lot of patients that have a negative connotation with counseling. All that's yeah. to say is like, it's, it's a pretty conservative environment. So, yeah. um, it's hard for me to get them to mm. go back to counseling sometimes, but I know a lot of therapists that work in, in big, you know, metropolitan areas like yours are just like hand in hand, sex yeah. educator, public PT, job yeah. and counselor. We've got like this yeah. trifecta of like people just helping, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is amazing, but it's, yeah. it's a little bit more of a struggle in my population. Mm. So I yeah. think that I use, I use my resources to like help combat yeah. that to the best of my ability until I feel like I can't. Yeah. Anymore. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. I think it's interesting what you said too, is just the ways that this work is so much more than physical yeah. and it's because it really is. And we, we, we've done such a good job as a society separating the brain and the body and the mental and the physical and the emotional and the physical. And so it's, I, I love that point that it's not just, you're not just going in and pushing on muscles and <laughs> releasing things and strengthening things. And that's all, <laughs> that's all physical therapy is, is just mechanics. And it's, it's just not. No. I love, love, love that point. Thank you. And, you know, I always, I know you said 75%. I often think, like, if you are someone in a femme presenting body in this world these days, like, I really are any of us unscathed from some sort of harassment, trauma, big T, little T. And so it's yeah. just, it's always, it's the soup we live in. And the body based practices, I think, get to the heart of that so easily. And, and I, I think it's so wonderful that you have those conversations. Yeah, me too. Mm. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, those were all the questions I had for you. Do you have anything else that you want to no. talk about? 
No, this awesome. is wonderful. This Thank is you. great, Kate. Oh my goodness. My, um, my colleagues are going to love this. Our customers Yay. are going to love this. So Yay. thank you so much for being on Kate yeah. and for everyone that wants to look at, um, passion by Kate mm -hmm. at passionbykate.com. Yep. And it's K A I T, which yes. is it across the board. So whatever your favorite platform is, Passion by Kate, K-A-I-T. If you spell it the regular way, you won't find it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll link it up in this too. Great. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Kate.